Today we will continue with two more sessions followed by the panel discussions. I'm certainly happy that by the triggering presentations, discussions and questions we have raised during the first day. We see that the audience is uh, significantly less this morning and of course we know the reason. Today is a funeral ceremony to comm comm commemorate Martin Schiebels who was important figure uh, in architecture society. We send our condolences to his family, friends and partners. We do hope that um, those people who were here yesterday will arrive here also today, later. And please, don't be afraid to come closer to the stage. I think you will have a better look. <laughs> so session three, <coughs> titled Beyond Intersections of Urban and Rural Baltic Perspectives, so pay attention to rural areas that on a planetary level today experience significant and alarming transitions in migratory front. We will look into the history of cities and countryside, focusing on Baltic states, and looking for a new perspectives of ruralism in a metropolitan society for Baltic space. We are going to start with keynote by Markus Schaffer. He holds a master's degree from Harvard University and master of science in neurobiology from University of Zurich. He is a founding partner of Josoya Schaffer Architects in Zurich and Smart Use, a startup that brings together planning, data, <coughs> and governance, producing digital, stool, digital tools for analog city. He has been teaching at Harvard University Strelka Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna or the Berlage Institute and lectures and publishes regularly. Prior to founding Josiah Schaeffer Architects, Markus was a director of AMO in Rotterdam, known as the Think Tank and Research Department of OMA, the office established by Rem Kohas. Josiah Schaeffer Architects is Zurich-based office for architecture, urban design and research founded in 2003. The office has won several international awards and is working on a wide spectrum of project projects throughout Switzerland and Germany. So please uh, welcome Markus with the talk Deep Urbanism. Welcome. Okay. Um, well, it's an amazing pleasure to be here. Thanks a lot that you are here. Um, sorry for my slightly disheveled appearance. Uh, my suitcase is still in Zurich. Uh, I'm sure it is the fault of Swiss port and not of Air Baltic, so the Swiss are not perfect. Uh, on the other hand, um, uh, I am here also due to the generous uh, funding of my trip by the uh, Swiss Embassy, so all the look of the Swiss Embassy is actually here. So I think they're I think there are good and bad things about Switzerland. They lose suitcases, but they're still extremely gracious hosts. Um, we are an office of around 28 uh, people in Zurich, more women than men, uh, more foreigners uh, than Swiss people. So we are an office of migrants, so to speak. And when we look where these people come from, they come from uh, all over Europe. This is an image of Europe. You see here the peaks of urbanity and you see here the kind of distribution uh, of population also uh, in the countryside in smaller cities and of course what we all know uh, in the context of this conference is that there is a kind of an, uh, a reorganization of this population happening where big urban centers are growing and smaller centers or smaller towns and the countryside is shrinking. People flock uh, to the world cities and the city and the world therefore through globalization is not becoming more flat and more equal and more even the world actually is becoming more spiky it's becoming more imbalanced in many ways Barak Khanna calls this connectography he says that the connection of cities and the connection they have with each other is in many ways even more important than uh, geographic locations. He talks about how this connectography shifts over time and lets ci uh, cities and urban systems reorganize themselves in an ever more fluid future. 
And in the end, connectedness is everything, because the connections between cities is very much the connections between neurons in a brain. You know, this is what makes the urban system functioning, powerful, add value, generate social differentiation and division of work, which in the end generates that surplus in cities, which make cities function in a global economy. So if you look at the cities system today, then you see these kind of downtowns of London, New York, the new downtowns coming up uh, in China. You see kind of hinterlands, which are, however are moving very quickly towards becoming more prosperous and more connected. So what you see here is the more red these cities are, the more globalized they are, uh, and the bigger they are, the more people are living in these cities and these agglomerations. This is the state today. To understand how this developed, it's a good idea to kind of look at today and just turn the time back. You know, just go backwards in history as if you were running a movie backwards from today's biggest cities to the 10 biggest cities in 1950, the 10 biggest cities in the 1900s, and so on. And the more you go backwards, the more these cities are kind of growing together into the origin of the uh, city system as we know it today, this being around 3000 before Christ, where cities were a fairly new invention and they were located in a very small region, but an extremely prosperous and powerful region, which at that time uh, dominated the known world uh, in the Mesopotamian area. And if you go even a bit more back, then you go to these very first settlements, uh, for example, here, uh, in the area of Göbekli Tepe in uh, southern Anatolia, or what you also know as the Fertile Crescent in today's um, um, Turkey. Now, this temple is in some ways, I would argue, a city in a nutshell. It's the first prototype of what urbanity means. Because what happened here, probably due to ecological pressures, is that people came together and they spent a lot of energy and a lot of time to build these huge machines, incubators, pretty much exactly like an incubator we are sitting in here today, right? A hall where people are um, dealing with each other, where we are stabilized by a space, the space of this hall where you are sitting in and are listening to me, and we are stabilized by a story. The story is that we have a conference, I'm a speaker, you're the audience, and that's accepted. You know, if you were a group of um, uh, chimpanzees, it would be impossible for me to talk to you like this, right? If we were in the Middle Ages and you were all coming from different uh, areas and towns, uh, this meeting would also be impossible because the institutional narrative binding us together would be too weak. Right? So we are stabilized by infrastructures and institutions, by spaces and stories, and in some ways this is the first uh, of this machine which allowed uh, human beings to do that over a long period of time. It generated, this big machine generated stability and it generated trust. And in the context of this machine, also those urban rituals and the urban elements you need to feed uh, people over a long time slowly were developing. Wheat was being domesticated. Animals uh, were being domesticated. The first beer was made. Probably wheat was domesticated because beer was such a great thing to have when you had your religious rituals, right? So the people were drinking beer. They were eating the domesticated animals, thinking about the past and thinking about the future uh, together. Now, a couple of thousand years later, what has been developed in this very, very first prototype of urbanity over a couple of thousands of years was then taken by people who walked down the rivers, the um, um, Euphrat um, and um, the river in uh, Mesopotamia. They walked down these rivers and further down in the desert, they created this now much bigger prototype of a city. A city here which has a wall around it, it has a differentiated um, urban fabric with streets and squares, and most importantly, in the center of this city, you have the temple. Now, this temple and the very first temple we have seen before, in many ways, are the same thing. 
an infrastructure and institution which stabilizes people in space and time so that they can cooperate uh, successfully. Temples in Mesopotamia were very much a redistribution engine. You went there to get work, you went there to get wheat and barley, you went there to get paid, right? So it was a redistribution engine and it was also the point which legitimized the city. So the king in the Mesopotamian uh, city-states was not so important. Also the Assyrians had weak kings. The temple was the most important thing because it organized society and it organized redistribution. So we have here Göbekli Tepe, right? This very, very first prototype. People walking down Euphrat and Tigris all the way to Ur. In Ur, uh, they then had these types of um, systems, right? And in Ur, they told stories about a mountain far back in time, far away, where the gods gave uh, people wheat, animals, stories, and the craft to work with straw and make baskets and so on and so on, right? So here, you still had the stories which developed here in the background, of course, now turned into a form of religion. And then in one of these cities in Ur, Abraham was born, right? And then Abraham walked all the way to the Levante, to here, uh, and of course started Judaism as we know today, one of the first religions which still survives until today, right? Always taking this urban idea with it, an urban idea which is a knowledge of infrastructure and it's a narrative of institutions and the narrative of institution, of course, the most powerful version of that is religion, right? A kind of a, a ritualized, formalized way of telling people where they come from and what their destiny in life should be. So if you think about cities in this way, then a city basically is a, a system which protects exchange, it protects a market, it stabilizes a market through infrastructure and institutions. That market controls resource flows and people coming in, and it exports services and goods. Right? It's a, it's a machine to generate new things and innovation uh, through social differentiation and the division of work, and it exports uh, things which are more complex, like good pottery, nicely done obsidian, um, uh, tools, etc., etc. And if you now have uh, these kinds of cities here, a core city, you have resources, goods, and people flowing in. You have services, specialized goods, representation, and security flowing out to a peripheral city because when you have a big city in the environment and you have resource flows coming in, at some point it makes sense to start a smaller city somewhere on this supply chain and this smaller city becomes smarter and smarter and smarter, and at some point the core city collapses, like the Mesopotamian cities collapsed, and then the peripheral city um, starts taking over. This is, a, this is a, a process, so the small city learning from the big city, which Jane Jacobs called import replacement, right? In the beginning, this small city imported all of the knowledge, the goods, the sophistication from the core city when, and became smarter and smarter and smarter when the core city collapsed, this smaller city was already viable. It survived and then became a core city itself. And with this system, you have a kind of a moving over Europe uh, from Mesopotamia to the Levante to um, Knossos, Mycenae, Athens, um, Rome, uh, Paris, uh, London, uh, then uh, the new continent and so on and so on, right? So the movie which we have seen running backwards first is now we are moving the movie again forward, right? Where this city idea is moving over the continent. So you have to imagine that after Abraham arrived here in the Levante, then the Phoenicians started spreading the idea of cities around the Mediterranean Sea. They started uh, um, kind of trade cities um, Knossos uh, started um, exporting olives and, um, and other agricultural goods to the Levante. 
then when Knossos uh, became, so, so Crete, right? When Knossos became weaker and had less trees which they needed for their big fleet, they went straight north to Mycenae, started buying fleet, uh, st uh, starting to buy timber. When then Knossos disappeared, Mycenae took over. After Mycenae, you had Athens. After Athens, Rome, Paris, London, and then we jumped over the Atlantic. So in some ways, you could argue that if this is the first moment of urbanization in a really primitive, extremely simple manner, then this in an industrial times is basically the same thing. Again, infrastructure and institutions, for example, railroad tracks and a schedule organizing the railroads, right? It's the same thing, it's just bigger, more powerful, more reach, right? Same thing bigger, more powerful, more rich. It's all about connectedness. Connectedness of people to people and of groups of people, i.e. cities, to other groups of people, other cities. Right? So, and what we do as human beings through our imagination and our storytelling, our ability to organize large uh, institutions and with these institutions stabilize very large amounts of people, we are doing nothing else than building this global brain together, neuron by neuron, connection by connection. So you could argue that the city system in the end is all about connectedness, uh, connectedness which allows you exchange, on the one hand exchange of things, and on the other hand exchange of information. You need to stabilize this connectedness with stability and Trust. Trust is basically the belief we have as human beings in stability lasting in the future, right? That's called trust. As soon as you have trust, you can capitalize on it. You know, if you believe social relations are stable in the future, you have social capital. If you believe that supply chains are stable in the future, you have kind of infrastructural capital. Uh, if you believe that ideas are stable in the future, you have cultural capital. And if you believe that value is stable in the future, you have financial capital. And this financial capital, then you have a little piece of paper signed by the president of your uh, bank, the bank of the nation, right, of the national bank, called money. And in the end, money is nothing else than organized trust, right? And this trust goes back to the belief we together have that our infrastructures and institutions are stable, they're lasting into the future. But of course we also need change and reinvention, you know, we need newness and cities are a system which we perfected over the last 10,000 years where stability on the one hand and change on the other hand works together, right? A lot of people here have never met before, still this is a stable environment because we are an urban culture, right? The other thing which is interesting, if you think that um, uh, connectedness needs to increase in reach, then it makes sense that whatever is heavy is around things, for example, gold coins, which are heavy, you try to turn them into information, into bits. You try to make it light, you know? Um, a stone scripture becomes, a uh, pergament letter becomes, uh, an, uh, an, an airmail letter becomes an email, right? This is nothing else than connectedness being so important on the one hand and so well stabilized on the other hand that we're able to turn this into that to make this grow while keeping this and that, right? So this is the technological basis for the expansion which we went through during the last uh, um, um, around 600 years after the end of the Middle Ages, and which brought us to the completely globalized, completely urbanized planet we are living in today. For Europe, this means if we now have this kind of urban system kind of growing this way, this means that uh, today we have a kind of a, a big uh, moment where these uh, cities uh, are, are really dense and quite productive and powerful, and we have here the Alpine Rim, and what we will see afterwards that Switzerland actually is at the intersection of the Alpine Rim and all of its diversity, its smallness, its fragmentation on the one hand, but Switzerland is also in the axis of the European urban system 
reaching from the Renaissance cities to the Hanse cities to London, or today, of course, from the industrialized northern Italy to southern Germany to uh, Belgium, Holland, and then all the way to London. Right? So this is this city system which has been generated over hundreds of years by constantly people linking these cities together by infrastructures and stabilizing these linkages by institutions. This is not, no, this is not just so easy as it sounds because building this uh, urban system also went um, uh, correlated with a lot of wars. So the darker this dot is, these are all cities, the darker this dot is, the more battles have been fought at this particular location, right? So the system also became uh, so dense here because um, along the Po and the Rhine River, the continent basically was best connected, but also most fought over, and therefore it made sense to make cities here with a wall protecting a market and people to do free business. Now what that means in total is that cities have temporal depth, right? If you look at the global system today, it's unbelievably difficult to understand what a city is. You have no clue, right? But if you go back in time to the very, very first moment of urbanity, you understand what a city is in a nutshell. Today, cities are nothing else. They're just bigger, more complicated, and more technologically enabled, right? Cities have network depth. So the first cities had uh, supply chains which were organized by donkeys, then later by boats. Today we have supply chains organized by big container ships and by planes. And cities have cognitive depth, constantly people thinking about them, making them better, and of course then also the cities as environments then serving as a medium, a format, uh, and an environment, again, stabilizing us in space and time to make us collaborate. So all of this together, starting from this nutshell in the beginning to whatever we have today is an emergent complex system which we are still uh, in the midst of. Now, Switzerland, basically, as said, is sitting uh, at the center uh, of this uh, European system, and uh, it's basically, again, the intersection of this mountainous region which was hard to cross, and the urban system which really, really wanted to cross these mountains, right? That's the reason why Switzerland is what it is. Switzerland before the infrastructure state, so before industry, before railroads and highways, was poor and fairly insignificant. People had to leave Switzerland, right? So these are um, uh, Ellis Island um, um, uh, emigrants uh, entering uh, New York, and you have here a New York Times article where I say, I have just been informed that the commune of Niederwil, district Zofingen in the canton of Argo in Switzerland, have been forwarding 320 of their poorest people to the United States. Right? We were a nation of emigration. We sent out colonists and we sent out mercenaries because we have no natural resources, uh, no power, and no urban system. But then something changed when infrastructure and industrialization happened. Um, there, all of a sudden, the many sources of energy, i.e. water in the mountains, and the many smart brains with nothing other to do, they started a kind of a proto-industrialization outside of the cities, still organized and dominated by the guilds, by the craftsmen, and this proto-industrialization turned into many little industrial um, uh, starting uh, factories on the one hand, and these factories then wanted to be linked, and that meant that through a lot of private interests, railroads were being built. So the system uh, was being connected, again, connectedness by these many private interests to build in this mountainous landscape these moments and connections uh, of infrastructure. And, you know, so you have this here, the kind of agricultural society, poor and insignificant, and industry and industrialization starting to kind of link things together. This was so important, uh, for example, here in the case of Herisa, which was in the uh, early 19th century, actually a fairly important uh, textile um, uh, town, that from an earlier railroad connection, which was a cul-de-sac ending here, uh, 
people spend a lot of energy, so here's the old railroad line, a lot of energy to so sink this um, uh, railroad station down to lower it so that it connect, could connect over a bridge and into a tunnel all the way to the Gotthard line. So here in 1910 when the train station opened. Right? This is what it is today, of course, now outdated. So we need to, here project by us, we need to reorganize that, but still with always with the same idea, connectivity, connectedness, to make sure that the urban system also deep into the countryside is connected up uh, to the world. The same thing happened also in the mountainous regions, right here, the Engadin, which of course in the beginning was a, a fairly barren uh, landscape, hard to cross, um, must have been unbelievably beautiful at the, at the, at the time um, when uh, almost no humans were here. But already in Roman times, uh, people started crossing uh, these uh, passages, started building villages. And then another thing happened, which is basically another project by us, uh, shown with another project by us, the, um, the regional airport in Zamedan, which is the airport of St. Moritz, where we are trying to make a kind of an iconic uh, building, almost, which Dagny actually worked on also. Um, which uh, really tries to be a kind of a land art in this uh, piece of land art in this absolutely amazing and beautiful uh, valley which was uh, planed out by the glaciers uh, about 10,000 years ago. Uh, a building which not only uh, sits in the uh, valley like this kind of piece of land art and protects the village uh, where you are now sitting, there will be the village uh, from the noise, but also lets people through these moments of transparency really look into the airport also. So that means uh, through infrastructure and industrializations, two things happen. On the one hand, uh, a lot of uh, people were always flowing in and out of Switzerland. So here was a moment of emigration, then moments of immigration. And through the last couple of uh, 100, 200 years, a lot of people actually came into Switzerland and started all of these companies for Switzerland, uh, for which Switzerland now is uh, famous and known for in the world, right? So this kind of phone book back here. So this uh, big people are, are uh, immigrants basically coming in, right? And this phone book back here is basically all the people who came and made Switzerland to what it is today. We are a nation of immigrants more than 30% of people in Switzerland right now, as we speak, are, are immigrants. Every third um, spouse, so husband or wife, uh, is an immigrant in, in Switzerland. And this melting pot in the center of Europe is basically what makes Swiss, Switzerland active. And that allow, allows then again to amass wealth. And then with this wealth, again, you can then, uh, with foreign direct investments, basically, so this is the... GDP of Switzerland, this size, and this is the foreign direct investment in the US uh, with kind of um, business hubs uh, and employees uh, of uh, Swiss companies. Uh, this is the Swiss fleet, but all of this is basically just done by um, an infrastructuralized nation which had nothing turning into a nation of industry uh, and that then uh, into a nation which could um, generate wealth and then use this wealth to, again, better connect itself uh, into the world. So this means that when you look at Switzerland today, you see these tiny municipalities kind of linking together, so the Alpine Rim would be here, and in these tiny municipalities you have these large functional urban regions, so again, this north-south axis of the European system going here through the Ticino, where uh, Mr. De Luca is coming from uh, Lugano down here to Zurich, uh, to Basel, then projecting all the way into uh, Germany, here all the way into the highly industrialized uh, northern Italy. And this um, system of, uh, of cities, of course, have been networked by um, infrastructure. So here, Orange Street, um, Red uh, Railroad. And, co it, and that is contrasted by a kind of a, a hinterland, a countryside, where, however, you then have these inserts, like we have seen with the airport, of, again, highly globalized um, uh, resorts which attract tourists from all over the world. 
If we now move into the, one of these metropolitan regions, uh, the region of Zurich, which is the most important economic powerhouse in Switzerland, then you see here that this idea of connectedness also works uh, on the scale of a city. This is the commuter footprint um, of uh, Zurich, uh, where uh, through uh, uh, railroads and a bit of car, people commute from places which are far out into Zurich uh, to work. So these settlements uh, you know, started by peasants, many here uh, in the mountains of Switzerland, have been connected together by infrastructure into this polycentric urban region. And this region, of course, is organized by traffic flows. It's, by the way, also organized by politics. This is a very typical image where the city is left, um, the uh, area around the city is, is liberal, so, so kind of in, in between, and the uh, surroundings, the countryside, is, is conservative. And in the end, this functional region is a kind of an overlay of infrastructure of these settlements which have different capacities to uh, um, deal with the future. So the more magenta, the more ability to change they have. And is then the place where we as architects put in our buildings and our area developments and so on. And the argument is that in the end, what's active in the global competition of location is not just Zurich, the medieval small town with walls, but rather it's the functional region of Zurich enabled by infrastructure and organized by good institutions. And this is the playing field of our office. So here we do um, housing developments where we use industrial heritage, uh, but reorganize it and change it into uh, places to live. So here you see the footprint of industry. Here, a kind of a garden area right next to it. This is a kind of a yin-yang idea of, of organized orthogonal and kind of green and free in, in, in organization. This is an old industrial hall, which we're now using as a kind of a lobby uh, for the community. Here you see how you enter uh, into the side from the, the urban to the green. And here, the kind of the park area in the back. Or another... Um, point, of course, which is important that if you then work uh, on uh, these cities, you need to also increasingly work uh, with people to, to uh, reorganize uh, these um, urban areas. So here, an area of the Federal Railways um, uh, Company, um, which is right in a very highly politicized um, uh, neighborhood uh, in Zurich where we had to really involve the people in order to do something they are also agreeing with. And this, in, this involvement we did in a really extreme case in that we really built uh, uh, the city with them, developed the urban idea with them, starting with a kind of a building kit uh, on the site, uh, turning that into building typologies, uh, which people could really work uh, on in detail and um, take pictures of, uh, debate, and in the end, um, uh, show us what they would really like to do. So again, if you are in one of these dense urban centers, you need to involve uh, the people in, a, in an age where political transparency in, is important. But we also need to make sure that we are future-proof, that also in the future we can still, even so Switzerland is urbanizing very rapidly, that we can still have these small moments of industry kind of um, uh, being productive and, uh, and still operating. So this is a client of us, Frau Zug, which produces white goods, so washing machines, refrigerators, ovens, and so on. Uh, this is the industrial site. And the idea is to turn this uh, into that, basically stacking the factory, um, making space for new um, industrial partners coming in. So from uh, an area only for one company, you now turn into a cluster for several companies, the so-called technology cluster, being co-creative, of course, being a, a place of innovation. And lastly, we're also opening the area, so we're taking the fence away and making sure the city uh, can come in, the city with all of its uh, ability to innovate and generate uh, moments of serendipity, which allows us to have good ideas together. So again, you have a kind of industrial site, which is one which is kind of monofunctional and a kind of an urban site where the functions are mixed in many kind of different ways. 
And the idea, of course, here is that even so, uh, this uh, is still a productive part of the city. Production has to work together with uh, public uh, areas, with commercial areas, with office spaces, with housing, in a kind of an ever more uh, well-organized uh, moment of um, um, urban uh, production. So we go from here to here, from 2018, 2045 and this is a topic which we are uh, interested in uh, right now uh, how to make sure we keep future proofing our cities in keeping industry close to where people uh, live and work and then finally of course we also need to think about the the, the countryside so this is a, a, a powerful uh, kind of uh, functional urban region which of course pulls people and opportunity uh, away from the countryside, so why, while this system is growing, and it's growing rapidly, with, uh, also with a lot of foreign planners like uh, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, uh, Palantir, um, Oculus, Rift, and so on, they're all uh, having uh, kind of um, um, offices and development uh, teams uh, in Zurich, uh, so it generates a lot of opportunity, but it also pulls opportunity away from the countryside, so we have to make sure that if we believe that Switzerland is still a well-organized um, national system in the future, that we also take care um, of the regions which are not so infrastructurally strong uh, as Zurich is. So if this is the region of Zurich, we then proposed uh, in our project for the national exposition, which is a thing Switzerland does um, frequently, to continuously kind of reinvent its narrative, these are large um, 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 expositions which basically show to the people and to the world uh, what Switzerland is about and what they can do. And these three cantons came together and made a competition for uh, um, an, an exposition uh, in this area. And we took this um, uh, opportunity with this competition, which we won, uh, to say what we should research now is actually really the landscape we are living in and how we are using this landscape. And the landscape of Eastern, Germ of Eastern Switzerland is actually interesting to do that because it consists of very different areas, of a kind of a lake area, an and urban area, an urbanized area, and a mountain area. We linked uh, these uh, areas together into this kind of adventure map, um, which can do different kinds of things. It can tell us where we came from, it, we can show uh, who we are and how we are organized, and we can uh, show people where we are going to. So we use this entire uh, landscape as a big stage set, and with this stage set we can um, also mobilize forces to give this structurally weak uh, area in Switzerland actually a bit more infrastructure, for example, connections uh, along the, um, the lake. We can rethink the urban core uh, of this agglomeration around uh, St. Gallen, and we can also, with new narratives, basically rethink on how the countryside uh, in the more mountainous region could work. Uh, and this, of course, in the mountains, a lot more thinking with temporary installations, temporary means of generating density, how these people, of course, have been doing uh, during centuries. The motor behind this uh, adventure, so, so to speak, is basically that we take existing railroad lines and we reorganize them and rethink them into an, an, an exposition schedule, um, which is organized around uh, three rings of railroads, uh, um, a, a coastal ring, a mountainous ring, and a kind of an urban ring, which is the urban ring basically connecting the agglomeration of St. Gallen uh, all the way uh, to the Rheintal, which is highly industrialized area between Switzerland and Austria, and all the way, of course, here then to the metro region uh, of Zurich. So this is a kind of a, a metro region by scenography, right? It's a metro region by programming. So where Zurich is a metro region by infrastructure and by sheer urban force, here we were organizing an idea where we could generate a temporary metro, metro region by having a really strong narrative. And here you see the technical background which we will need to do that and the trains as a kind of a narrative tool going through the city. Now of course what is always in the background is, is this issue of data and that data actually is 
generating con connectedness, which is so more, much more powerful than anything which we could do with infrastructure, that it starts overruling infrastructure. It starts generating new kinds of uh, connectivity and therefore also the argument being requires new institutions and new narratives. So this is the last project. It's actually a spin-off of our company where we're working toward a kind of a civic data commons saying that this system here which is nicely organized by infrastructure and, and well um, uh, kind of um, governed by the institutions which we have in Switzerland, which are all built around subsidiarity, subsidiarity being the idea that always the smallest unit in a nation makes the decisions, and only the important questions like national defense and so on are delegated uh, to burn the capital, for example. Something like that we also need to do uh, in the space of data. The difficulty, of course, being today that data is being extracted from where we live and analyzed and organized, for example, in the Silicon Valley, and then fed back to us uh, on the one hand uh, in terms of services by Google, for example, on the other hand, of course, also by um, um, predictions of our behavior. So we pay with our behavior for the services we enjoy. The question is how can we kind of relocalize that? So this is a project um, where we worked with big data and open data again on the metro region of Zurich, where we're trying to go from this, which was done by computer-aided design and statistics, to something like this, which is done by GIS and statistics, so geographic information systems and statistics, to something like this, which is increasingly uh, automated and organized by big uh, and open data. So uh, there's a platform uh, now running uh, which takes data from different types of um, sources and puts them together in a standardized way um, so that it can be used uh, by people to uh, top, bot top down and bottom up by people, so by the authorities as well as by the citizens to rethink uh, their um, uh, spaces. We also do that specifically for rural areas uh, with a product which we called which we call a municipal scan. Municipal scan is basically the idea that we enable small municipalities to organize their own data, to, to take uh, the kind of the data uh, governance and the data authority back uh, to kind of a local entity. And increasingly uh, with this kind of new uh, company which we founded, we're trying to do that also for um, all sorts of um, uh, collectives um, from municipalities, but also to interest groups, um, to citizens, with the idea in the end to empower local collectives, so localized uh, uh, people and their interests with localized data so that they can, again, also in a digital age, take care of their infrastructures and institutions to generate uh, a good life in the future. So that means we have understood that cities are organized by uh, what I call deep urbanism. So they have, cities have temporal depth, they go back to, the, to an origin which we can understand. So whatever complexity we see today, we can understand when we go back to the very first uh, idea of cities. Cities have network depth, so they are all about connectedness and disconnectedness goes up and down. So Rome, the Roman Empire had a huge amount of connectedness and then it collapsed to a moment where the connectedness was, was very uh, fragmented, right? The prediction is we will also go into some form of collapse where connectedness uh, will again uh, fragment. And of course, in the end, we also have seen that cities are done by people constantly um, working on cities and the city acting back uh, on the people and that then together uh, being this kind of emergent complex system. And if we understand cities like that, then we need deep moves, so we need to think ahead. We cannot only do an urban design today and not think about the future. We need to use the best technology which we can uh, apply uh, in, in concert, so the, the, the physical and the digital, and we need to make sure that whatever we do, we do with the people and need to make sure that people like it because in the end, uh, they are, the, they, they are uh, the, the clients who kind of decide the future with us. And the aim is, finally, subsidiarity and resilience in our infrastructures and institutions for which I believe Switzerland is a great case study. Thank you.